absolutely. And then, uh, I think it's already happening. And we're back. You know, from what is trendy in communications to what is trendy on our backs, we're back with Bertrand Pellegrin. Welcome. Thank you so much. I was joking about the, the name of your consulting practice, BP Limited. That's not the, that's not the people BP that... BP Consulting. Yeah, yeah, BP Consulting. It's not the oil spill no, people. No, but I'm pretty oily sometimes. <laughs> I, hear, <yeah>. I know. <laughs> Speaking of oily, <laughs> what is it that makes a man look slick? This whole book you've got here, Branding the Man, Why Men Are the Next Frontier in Fashion Retail, what is it that makes a man look slick and uh, and chic? I think you know, without a doubt, it really comes down to great tailoring, and I think mm -hmm. that that's uh, you know, when I work with clients, uh, whether it's retail clients or whether it's one-on-one -on -one with clients, the first thing I always notice is that if I put them in a great suit, they suddenly get it. Um, most men don't really understand the power of fashion, the power that fashion has to convey to other people who they are than beautiful tailoring. You put a man in a great suit and suddenly he feels like he's much better about himself. I was, I was flipping through this book before we started the interview and I saw this great picture of Sean Connery uh, from the classic James Bond films and I right. think the phrase you used was the archetypal male. Yeah. And it made me think about just, gosh, is it possible to look better as a male than James Bond did in Goldfinger or something like that? And why is that? Well, and isn't it funny that we keep, that we still to this day reference you know, films with Sean Connery, you know, 40 years later, 40, 50 years later that, you know, when from the first one that came out, it's pretty incredible that this man still represents to every young man today and every middle-aged man today the epitome of masculinity. And do you think that that's true when you say for young men, meaning men in their 20s, 30s, uh, that look, has that come back or did it ever not I, I don't think it ever really got, went away at all, and I think if you look at young men today, certainly if you look at Generation Y, which would be kids starting at age 13 all the way to age 18 and more, they are already starting to shop differently than certainly we did when we were younger. Mm -hmm. um, you can go down to the mall and you'll see a pack of you know, straight men, teenagers, who are shopping together in groups. When I was a teenager, we didn't do that. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, we didn't. I, I was just laughing about the concept of a group of thirteen-year-old gay men shopping at a mall. It might be different, but uh, yes, do, do, that might be on, different. Do you really think that thirteen-year-old <laughs> straight guys are going down to the mall to shop for clothes? Together? I've seen them myself. Go to go to Abercrombie and Fitch, and you will see that there's a lot of teenage kids that are hanging out there, and it's it's actually become a center for where teenage girls go to meet the boys. So that's part of the reason why they've actually designed the environment with couches and so on, is to really sort of encourage this kind of community going on. And if you go down there on a Saturday afternoon, you're going to see little gaggles of girls hanging out and boys hanging out. And they're both sort of all sort of playing this little game with each other in the middle of the store. But are they shopping? I mean, it is, And they're shopping. Yeah, and so Abercrombie shopping. and Fitch isn't doing this because they just want attractive people hanging out on their couches, oh, or maybe they do. It's very strategic. It's very much a play, creating a sense of community where there isn't one, right? I mean, there really isn't any place for young people to really go and hang out. It's traditionally has been the mall. What better way to get them into the store than to provide them a place where they can actually sit and flip through magazines and talk to each other and, oh yeah, by the way, maybe buy some product. Now, this is a longer philosophical question that we have time for in this show, but when I was growing up as a teenager, if I had said I wanted to go shopping for clothes, that would be considered gay. Right. Now, of course, I was gay, mm -hmm. but the idea of being called that yeah. meant I didn't want to do anything to do with shopping. Sure. It was like whatever my mother brought me or bought me, I put on, and the messier it was and the less kind of tailored, more I thought it was straight or male. Mm -hmm. And now what you're telling me is we have a generation of young men who think it's chic and acceptable to go out and buy clothes? It's not only, it's not only chic and acceptable, it's, it's necessary. If you want to succeed in the workplace, if you want to move out of middle management into senior management, you need to look the part. You can't be dressing in your fleece jacket and your polo mm -hmm. shirt anymore mm -hmm. necessarily. That doesn't say to me senior management. That's what this book is really right. about. How, well two things. How important has been kind of the rise of the metrosexual and the mainstreaming of gay culture, and if you think that is what has been happening over the last 15 years in Hollywood, mm -hmm. been to this retail trend? Absolutely. I think you look at people like Brad Pitt, you look at George Clooney. These are straight men, successful men, that have been able to make it acceptable for the ordinary guy to suddenly look okay, to care about what he looks and how he, how he dresses. Um, sports celebrities who at one time didn't dress very well now are very much aware of the power of dressing and how that can actually change how people look at you. And I think that's what really comes through here. 
When did this start to really impact you? I remember meeting you about 20 years ago when you were an executive at Channel 4 mm -hmm. in the Bay Area. And you were always chic and always said, wow, Bertrand has really got it going on. But when did you think, I can do this for other people if there's a career here? Uh, I think really I, I st really saw that there was an opening in the market. I really saw that men were changing how they were dressing, that the um, that society was changing in terms of um, sexual roles that people were having with each other, the influence of gay culture, um, and that there was really a, an opportunity here to really evolve the retail culture and mm -hmm. make it very different than it's ever been before. I think that's what's happening now. When you look at that picture of, of Sean Connery as James Bond, that is kind of the prototypical 1960s look. Now we've got a whole nother take on the prototypical 1960s look, the show Mad Men, mm -hmm. which is now in its, I don't know, fourth or fifth season or something. How important has that been to what we're talking about here, branding the man? Yeah, I think, wow, I think, I think Mad Men has had a really major impact on how um, men are looking not only at themselves, but really understanding what is possible for them. I think that's, you know, we're talking about really the 1960s, the early part of the 1960s with Mad Men, um, but yet in many ways we're seeing a lot of that, that's those same elements coming back again. There's a lot of issues in terms of gender relationships that we haven't dealt with there, um, a mm -hmm. lot of issues about sexuality. That's really what Mad Men is truly about. It's not just about what it takes to be a man in our society, it's about what it takes to be a woman in our society. Right. And I think when you dress a certain way, it defines who you are. Uh, I think men are realizing that how you dress really conveys your masculinity mm -hmm. uh, in very, very subtle ways. If you go to Italy or to France, they really understand the power of, of clothing. And a beautifully tailored jacket says masculine. It doesn't say gay. It doesn't say any of mm -hmm. those things. Do you necessarily have to spend a lot of money to, to have your own unique style? No, I don't think so at all. I really don't think so at all. I think, as, I, as I've said in the very beginning, uh, it really does always come down to tailoring. I think tailoring is the most important thing. You can go and buy something that doesn't cost very much money, but to have it properly tailored, and you can look fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I really always try to teach ever, all of my clients that I work with in terms of image styling, is really getting them to understand that proper fit is critical. So give me a... Uh, and your shirt does fit you, by the way. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, I was scared to death to answer the question, <laughs> so thank you for, for getting me out of that. And of course, my pants and shoes are hidden, but they're fabulous and they fit well, too. <laughs> Actually, um, he's not wearing any. <laughs> thank you, Badum Bum Ching. Yeah. Um, tell me how you get your clients, and give me a disaster story and a success story. You know, reality shows are, are so hot right now. I mean, sure. you know, you see the shows. I mean, my favorite is there's a show now with RuPaul where he has drag queens teaching frumpy straight women right. how to look like drag queens. I'm still kind of working with that one, but <laughs> it's all about this uh, metamorphosis in front of our eyes. What metamorphoses have you successfully uh, created and which ones didn't work so well? I think uh, just to be really brief, I mean, I've, I've worked with you know a Fortune 500 executive who um, didn't feel like he was getting enough respect in the world of, of, of his work and um, also didn't really know how to dress and was also unhappily single and trying to meet women and uh, I definitely sort of worked with him in terms of really trying to understand how to dress successfully which didn't have to be a painful experience but that it can actually be a pleasurable experience and I think that was the other thing that uh, happened to him is that he realized that actually dressing well can be fun it makes you feel more confident um, and it makes people respect you in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I would say worst case scenarios are probably that, um, <clears throat> that men who um, have not necessarily um, been able to grasp all the details and so they're, you know, while they may wear a great jacket, they're really wearing really bad shoes. And a lot of times men think that they can get away with bad shoes. Um, but the fact of the matter is that when we look at somebody, we start with their face and we work our way down. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going down and the finish of the statement is the shoes and you're wearing bad shoes, is that kind of ruins is, the is, whole is thing. Is that a <laughs> guy girl thing? I mean, or is it, or is it just a gay guy, straight guy thing? Or do you think all guys? Just I don't think don't it's either one. I think it's very much a culture. I think American culture is very much like that. Uh, certainly, if you go to Europe, you won't see men care about shoes there. Uh, men care about shoes in other countries, but for some reason, Americans have become so casual that we've kind of given up on a lot of things. Well, now you, you raise an interesting point. Has America become so casual that? 
kind of what you do is almost like tilting at windmills sometimes. I mean, we, I mean, we even now see political figures who at formal events don't wear a tie. Right. I'm very old fashioned. Mm -hmm. I'm not wearing a tie now, but you know, I'm doing a show and that's kind of the look of the show, I hope. Mm -hmm. But boy, if I go to a formal event or I think there's gonna be a, a presentation, I got a tie on. Am I just hopelessly out of date? That's, you know, it's funny that you say that because I think that's partly, um, it's, a, it's an effort, it's, a, it's, a, it's really an attitude, a very American attitude to try and um, dumb things down a little bit for your audience. And I think that when guys are not wearing a tie like that, especially when they're someone who's a politician or somebody like that, that it's an effort to be more approachable. Um, yeah, I always sure feel like they made, true. Yeah, they, it's like they made a choice not to wear a tie when really they look better with a tie. Right. In our last few moments, Give me some trends you see coming up in 2011 for fashion and retail for um, men. Yeah, for men. I, I mean, I think actually menswear retail is going to be really sort of um, one of the unexpected surprises of where retail is going right now. And it's already happening right now as we speak um, that you've got a lot of uh, retailers now that are really making concerted efforts to really change how they're selling to men. That's everything from the retail uh, customer experience to the actual products. So they it's carry. no more just about teenage girls. Absolutely. And not. you heard it here on Bertrand Pellegrin. <laughs> he said it. Go to Abercrombie and Fitch. They're going to be good looking guys and girls sitting on the couch buying clothes. Who knew? <laughs> I'm David Perry. This has been 10%. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.